Okay, now to talk about the substance-induced altered states of consciousness. These are called caused by what we're going to call psychoactive drugs. Psycho meaning mind, active meaning active or doing things, right? So these are substances that act on the mind. You can take, like, anything that you put in your body that has some change to it is a drug, right? Like Tylenol is a drug, but it's not psychoactive because it doesn't interfere with your thinking or change your thinking in any way, right? So um, people take drugs for a lot of reasons. This isn't a D.A.R.E. program. I'm not going to yet lecture you about don't do drugs. I'm just going to give you information about what they all do and the sort of damage that they can do to your brain and your development, and then you should be able to decide pretty objectively not to do them. So I'm not going to preach. Um, sometimes people do it just to alter their perception of reality. Sometimes it's for a social need or a um, emotional reliance on drugs or from peer pressure. There's all kinds of different reasons. Coping with stress uh, that people take drugs. But basically any a psychoactive drug is anything that affects the mind, a chemical that's external that you take into your body to affect the mind. Um, tolerance you probably have heard of this word before, tolerance. Tolerance is the reduction in effectiveness of a psychoactive drug or like any lots of kinds of drugs over time with repeated use. So essentially what happens, let's say you're taking a drug that affects dopamine in your brain. There are lots of them that affect dopamine. It's one of the most common neurotransmitters targeted by psychoactive drugs. So let's say this is the amount of dopamine that your brain wants to produce, right? And when you take the psychoactive drug, it's sort of makes more dopamine or it looks like dopamine or whatever so now your brain thinks there's this much dopamine well it goes that's more than i need i'm not going to build as much myself because i'm getting it from outside so now your the part of your dopamine amount that your brain was building itself reduces so the whole amount of dopamine in your brain goes back down meaning now you're reliant on the drug just to get to the baseline level of dopamine that you used to produce on your own so now you need more of that drug to get the same amount of dopamine you used to, or dopamine sort of high or effectiveness that you used to get with the drug plus what your brain was producing. Essentially, what happens with psychoactive drugs that you can build a tolerance to, and that's basically all of them, is that your brain starts to rely on the drug to create the neurotransmitters that it used to build on its own. So you're adapting to the presence of the drug in your brain to try to prevent having too much of something or not enough of something. And so you keep having to use more and more of the substance in order to get the same effect because your brain is compensating for the drug use that you're doing. The longer you use the drug and the more frequently, the more of a tolerance you're going to build up. So it's not true that uh, alcohol is a really common one. People like to attribute tolerance of alcohol to things like ethnic heritage, like, oh, I'm Irish, so I can drink a lot. It's not the case, right? It's purely cultural. In cultures where people are used to drinking from a younger age, regularly with meals or things like that, they're going to have more of a tolerance built up because of that frequency of exposure. If you're in a culture where you never drink or you just don't have a lot of exposure to alcohol for whatever reason, your tolerance is going to be lower. So I could be as Irish as the day is long, but if I've never touched a drop of alcohol in my life, I will not automatically have a higher tolerance than someone else purely because of that heritage, right? So it's sort of a myth that that heritage has anything to do with alcohol tolerance or anything else. It's purely about your exposure to certain substances and your tolerance will change over time. If you stop using a drug, tolerance can disappear. And this is actually how a lot of people overdose and die on substances like heroin. They will go off of heroin, get sober, right? Reduce their tolerance because they've been sober for a while and then sort of relapse, backslide, hang out with the wrong people, whatever. But they're used to needing a much higher dose of heroin to get high than what their tolerance is currently allowing them to handle. So they take way too much and kill themselves or overdose and end up in the hospital uh, with serious issues because their tolerance isn't there anymore uh, and they took way more than they needed. This is actually a really common cause of death by overdose with severe drugs like cocaine and heroin. Um, so it can be a big problem. Don't do drugs. All right, uh, there's two kinds of dependence, psychological and physiological. Physiological dependence is what I was just talking about with tolerance, that your brain becomes reliant on the drug for its daily functioning. So if you stop taking the drug, you have withdrawal symptoms, things like fevers or shaking or vomiting, uh, bad moods. It doesn't always have to be headaches. It doesn't always have to be life-threatening. Withdrawal symptoms can take a lot of different forms. It depends on what the substance is that the person was reliant on. 
and how long they were reliant on it, um, how much tolerance they had built up, for example. So when we talk about addiction and withdrawal, that's typically referring to physiological or physical dependence on a drug. Psychological dependence is when you're reliant on it, not necessarily because your brain needs it to function, but because you need it emotionally to deal with the stress in your life or the situations that you're going through. And so the psychological dependence is what keeps you going back using the drug, even if you don't have that physiological addiction to back it up. Uh, a lot of times they come hand in hand, not always. You can have one without the other, um, but usually in a lot of people who use drugs, it's both. All right, now we're going to go through the different types of psychoactive drugs. The first ones we're going to talk about are depressants and opiates. Depressants are any drugs that slow down the activity in your brain, right? They depress it. Um, so this can be mental activity, physical activity, whatever, but they're slowing down the rate of neurons activating in your brain. Right, so some examples of depressants are barbiturates, which are sleeping pills, opiates, which is why they're on this slide, they're an example of a depressant, alcohol is a depressant. Um, so opiates suppress pain response and reactions to stimuli, barbiturates sort of repress your conscious awareness, so they make you sleepy, and alcohol depresses your frontal lobe. So what it's slowing down is your ability to speak, um, motor functionings are, functioning is slowed down, impulse control and judgment right, which is why people can act wild and crazy while drunk, it's not that they're being stimulated, it's that their ability to control their behavior is being depressed. Now, opiates are drugs that repress your physical sensations, your response to the environment. Um, typically, they're painkillers. These are, they're called opiates because they're derived from opium, which is a substance, it's, opium is like the OG opiate. Um, it's developed from poppies, and it used to be a really huge problem. If you remember from world history, the Opium Wars, where the Europeans deliberately spread opium addiction and use in China to try to gain a favorable trade position and caused a bunch of shenanigans there. Um, opium is highly addictive, and all of the drugs that derive from it, like morphine and heroin and other things, um, you can get over, you can get prescription painkillers like Percocets and whatever. These are all opiates because they all target these centers of the brain that release endorphins, which are positive. Um, it's like the runner's high. Endorphin is a neurotransmitter that reduces pain in the brain. Opiates look like endorphins, but they do a way, they're way stronger uh, and have more of effect. So you can have opiates will have a person feel like they're totally detached from their body or they can't feel anything and they're typically really, really addictive. Like one opiate use can get you addicted and uh, difficult to quit and the withdrawal symptoms can be really severe. So opiates are not something to mess around with. And opiate addiction is actually becoming a really big problem in the U.S. and around the world. Next to the stimulants. Stimulants excite your ner central nervous system. So they rev you up. Depressants slow you down, stimulants rev you up. This is things like amphetamines or speed, cocaine, um, ecstasy is both a stimulant and a hallucinogen, so you can kind of put it in either category. Uh, caffeine and nicotine are all stimulants. Um, so nicotine is the active effect in, cig in cigarettes. Uh, not good. Even if you're not smoking an actual cigarette, nicotine is itself highly addictive and dangerous to the health of your heart and the functioning of your respiratory system. So it's not a good idea to start using e using nicotine, even if you're doing it without the tobacco smoke, like with e-cigarettes. It's still not good for you. Um, also, fun fact, the uh, medications that are used to treat ADHD are stimulants also, but what they stimulate is the centers of your brain responsible for behavior control and attention. So they're stimulating you, but it seems like it has the opposite effect in people with ADHD because it's helping them control their behavior better. Last are the hallucinogens. Hallucinogens are drugs whose primary effect is to make a person hallucinate or have perceptions without sensation, right? So there's a lot of examples of these. There's a lot of man-made hallucinogens that get generated a lot. And there's more examples of drugs in all of these categories. I'm just giving you sort of the big ones. Um, so the biggest ones that you might be familiar with or have heard of are LSD or acid, uh, PCP, which is not as common anymore, but it's uh, still a pretty strong hallucinogen, mescaline, which is peyote, so mescaline is, is a, peyote is a cactus plant, and it's used primarily for religious purposes in like native tribes of Native Americans, not all of them, but some. And so it's actually 
sort of controversial that people, these tribes have been using peyote for like their whole history prior to when Europeans came and colonized the states and did a bunch of terrible stuff to the tribes. Um, and then we outlawed peyote. So a bunch of these people were being persecuted or put in jail for doing a traditional religious practice. And there are some communities that have special exemptions for peyote because of that. So it's kind of a interesting controversy as a side note there. Um, and also psilocybin, which is magic mushrooms. These are all hallucinogens. Um, marijuana, I put on this slide because it kind of fits in multiple categories. It fits as a depressant because it does slow down your sort of cognition and your functioning. But I also put it under hallucinations because it can, hallucinogens, because it can be a mild hallucinogen. Not as strong as some of these other ones that are on this slide, but it's still in there. Um, it also plays a role in sedation and relief of pain. So it's kind of a weird hybrid that it doesn't fit very well in any of these categories. So I just stuck it on this slide at the bottom.